Income tax 2023-2024, residential rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of the dwelling were focused on rental income this time. Get ready and some coffee because contrary to popular belief, you need a strong imagination to do income tax preparation. Most of this information can be found in first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one. Because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts. A must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Publication 527, residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. The Schedule E rental property typically rolls into line one income of the individual income tax formula. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement where we have income minus, instead of expenses, deductions resulting in, instead of net income, taxable income. However, also note that the Schedule E, similar to the Schedule C for a sole proprietor business, is a separate income statement in essence in and of itself having rental income minus rental expenses which you could call rental deductions resulting in in essence net rental income which is what flows into line one income of the formula this formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 this being the first page of the form 1040 where the schedule e rental income ultimately rolls into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part number one the schedule e rolling into line five rental real estate which has the attach of the schedule e this is the schedule e called the supplemental income and loss from rental real estate royalties and so on and so forth basically an income statement format for the rental properties all right diving into it we have the rental income and expenses if no personal use of the dwelling so we went over some of the new items in a prior presentation and we went over some of the reminders, noting that we're thinking now about the Schedule E, which you can kind of compare in your mind if you have experience with a Schedule C in that we have a separate form that's basically kind of like an income statement. Therefore, we're going to have income and expenses related to it. The income is fairly straightforward because we're going to have income from the rental use. The expenses are often a bit more complicated because we, have, because we have more categories of expenses and we need to know if we can apply those expenses or deductions to the Schedule E versus some other place that we might be able to deduct, for example, expenses on the tax return. And we also have that splitting if we have the use of the property for personal and uh, business use, like if it was a vacation home or if we were renting part of our home. In this case, we're gonna eliminate that second complication because we're gonna imagine, for example, that we had a separate piece of property, possibly a separate home that we have for just investment purposes and rental income purposes. We're not using it as a vacation home. We're not living in it. 
allowing us to do what we would like to do as a bookkeeper and business person, keeping our business stuff separate from the personal stuff, making it easy to do the books on both, making it easy to then judge how well we're doing on a particular type of business because it's not commingled and possibly how well we're doing personally, uh, aiming those goals on our financial statements towards other objectives. Obviously, rental income, the rental objective is the generation of income and the personal objective is more complicated to live well and so on and so forth. So we have the more, more easy or simplified scenario here with uh, no personal use of the dwelling and then in future presentations, we might get more complex with uh, personal use of the dwelling. So this chapter discusses the various types of rental income and expenses for a residential rental activity with no personal use of the dwelling. Generally, each year you will report all income and deduct all out-of-pocket expenses in full. The deduction to recover the cost of your rental property depreciation is taken over a prescribed number of years and is discussed in chapter two. So one of the big differences between say a schedule C business, especially small businesses where you have like gig work or something like that, and a schedule E situation is on the schedule E with the rental property, you're gonna have the property itself, which is gonna have to be put on the books typically as an asset, remembering that there is no balance sheet on a normal like 1040 income statement. All we have is typically the income statement part, which is the schedule E, but we have the balance sheet account, fixed asset account of property, plants, and equipment on a depreciation schedule. And then we're going to be able to get the benefit of the use of that property in the form of depreciation as an expense, at least for the building component, not the land component. And that's going to be a huge part of uh, the schedule E that we, may, we we got to dive into. Caution. If your rental income is from property you also use personally or rent to someone at less than a fair rental price, first read chapter five. So we're talking here about the more simplified situation where it's just rental property. Also note, we often run into these situations where we're, we're renting to someone that's a related person. That also becomes a problem because typically when we think about the taxes and the transactions, we think of them as arm's length transactions in a in a capitalistic sense, that helps us to determine what the fair market value is. If you're renting to like a family member, like a son or something like that, or a daughter, then you can clearly imagine that part of that rental might be less than the market value. And it might be part of just basically a gift or something like that, which dips into questions about uh, gifts and, and uh, estate taxes and that kind of stuff as well as the reporting of the proper amount of rental income. And if there's loss situations, then that becomes a, a thing you have to be considering as well. So if you have related parties, uh, keep that in mind that you wanna make sure that you're diving into more detail about what you need to do with related parties. All right, rental income. In most cases, you must include in your gross income all amounts you received as rent. That's pretty straightforward. The IRS tax code for income basically says, in essence, everything is included in income unless the IRS says otherwise. So no matter what kind of rental that you're doing, the income side is usually fairly straightforward because they're going to pay you for the rental part of the property. In other words, even if you use the rental property for business and personal, the amount of income you're going to get is only related to the business component. They're not going to pay you for the personal use of the rental property. And therefore, the determination of the income is usually fairly straightforward, whereas the expenses can be more difficult because we pay for things on the rental property, which might be allocated to personal and business if we had a situation where we used it both for personal and business. Here, we're thinking about primary just business use or business use or rental use. Rental income is any payment you receive for the use of occupation of property. It isn't limited to amounts you receive as normal rental payments. Once again, it isn't limited to amounts you receive as normal rental payments. Okay, when to report. When you report rental income on your tax return generally depends on whether you are a cash or accrual basis taxpayers. Most individual taxpayers use the cash method. So we have the similar situation as you might be used to with a Schedule C, noting that the tax return itself 
Individual taxes are usually more on a cash-based system. However, they deviate from a cash-based system sometimes when the IRS suspects that the cash-based system is being abused, which it can be because the cash-based system will be dependent on cash flows, which you can manipulate by manipulating the cash flows. In other words, if I want to have less income this year because I think my overall income is going to be higher and I was on a cash-based system, I might try to do things like, say, not collect the rent until the following year, just adjusting the cash flows, even though I, even though they might have already used the property. So that's when you would think the IRS might put restrictions on the cutoff periods so that people don't manipulate the cash flows to adjust uh, the income on uh, the cutoffs. On the other side, we might, for example, try to increase the amount of expenses that we pay this year uh, in order to get more rental deductions. That would be prepaying the expenses. And again, the IRS might say there's going to be exceptions in that case. So you can elect possibly to use a cash-based system generally or an accrual-based system. Oftentimes people use a cash-based system because it's more simple to just follow the cash basis, but the tax code might be weary or put in regulations with regards to certain transactions, like I say, with the prepaid expenses, or if you if you got prepaid for the rent, for example, where the IRS might want to record it as income when you've received it rather than when you earned it in that case. All right, on the cash method. So you are a cash basis taxpayer. If you report income on your return and the year you actually or constructively receive it, regardless of when it was earned, you constructively receive income when it is made available to you, for example, by being credited to your bank account. So with regards to renting property, if we had a second home, they are using the second home. Then the question is, do we record income when we receive the income or do we record the income when they actually lived in the property? Usually they're fairly close because if they pay us on a monthly basis, then you know they paid us pretty close to the, to the same point in time that they lived in the property. But you can imagine a situation where they pay you like in advance for a year's worth of rent, for example, before they actually live in, in the property. So obviously the cash-based system is easier because you can imagine if you used software, for example, then we might use like bank feeds. If you use like a QuickBooks, the bank feeds will receive the cash and you can easily allocate that cash receipts to income. So from a bookkeeping spec perspective, that's easier to do than basically putting it in the books as basically, you know, pre uh, an, an asset uh, uh, prepaid or something like that or, or unearned revenue, revenue that you have received, but you have not, they have not lived in it yet which takes a little bit more complexity with the bookkeeping. So again, most people kind of like the cash-based system just for ease of use from a bookkeeping standpoint and reporting standpoint. The accrual method's a bit more complex because you end up with those accrual accounts on the balance sheet, possibly like unearned revenue and prepaid expenses and so on. And you have to track those things instead of just following uh, the cash. But in theory, it's more accurate because it's actually recording your income statement accounts, income and expenses when you incurred the income and expenses rather than when you just paid the cash. And you can imagine, again, areas where the cash-based system can be heavily distorted by just manipulating when cash is paid, when cash is received, which is what the IRS will be skeptical of, even if you're on a cash-based system, putting in guidelines in certain circumstances where you can't, you know, you can't, uh, do that. You can't record it on a cash-based system. You have to convert to an accrual-based system in certain cases, possibly. So if you are an accrual-based taxpayer, you generally report income when you earn it rather than when you receive it. You generally deduct your expenses when you incur them rather than when you pay them. So more information. You can see publication 538, accounting periods and methods for more information about when you constructively receive income and accrual methods of accounting. Types of income, the following are common types of rental income, advanced rent. So one of the issues with rental property is usually they pay on a monthly basis. So they pay fairly close oftentimes to when they actually use the property, which might be different for certain rental property because sometimes if you have like business rental, you know, sometimes they could pay yearly or something like that, but usually it's monthly. But you also might have this advanced payment or like a deposit uh, kind of situation 
And the question is, well, what do you do with that? So advanced rent is any amount you receive before the period that is that it covers. Include advanced rent in your rental income in the year you receive it, regardless of the period covered by the method of the accounting you use. Now you might say, hey, wait a second. If I'm on an accrual based method and they give me an advanced payment, then I should record it as unearned revenue on the balance sheet rather than as revenue because they haven't yet used the property. But notice the, the, the IRS is saying you already got the cash and you're probably not going to have to give them back the cash in that case. Therefore, you have the money to pay the taxes. And the IRS is, seems to me taking the position we want to get paid when you get the money, when you have the cash. So that's kind of a weird situ, kind of a weird rule example. In March 18th, 2023, you signed a 10-year lease to rent your property. During 2023, you received 9,600 for the first year's rent and 9,600 as rent for the last year of the lease. You must include 19,200 in your rental income uh, in 2023. Now, if you were on a cash-based system, it would be like, yeah, well, you got both the cash then, so you might just record it as income when you received it, and that kind of makes sense. But really, on an accrual-based system, they haven't, you haven't really incurred the, the second amount because they haven't used the property. So you would think on an accrual-based system, you would record 9,600 as revenue, and then the other cash you would receive would be unearned revenue, until the point in time it has been earned when they live in the property. And, and the IRS is saying, well, because you don't have to give the cash back, it's not like a deposit in this situation, which might be a little bit different in that case, because it's the, you're, you're getting the last month's rent in this case. And the IRS is saying that they want, they want their piece of the revenue uh, when you get the money. Canceling a lease. Uh, if your tenant pays you to cancel a lease, the amount you receive is rent. So if you have an agreement and you say you have to you have to live in it, you're going to live here for a year. They cancel it early because you got some crazy neighbors that are that are driving them crazy. So I'm, I have to get out of here. So then you leave, and then and then the, then you re, then you're going to collect on them. You say you broke the contract. You have to pay us more money if you want to get out of here. Uh, and so then uh, and so that's going to be income, of course, because now you're going to get income from the breaking of the contract and the more money that possibly have to be paid to do that to get out of there so include the payment in your rental income in the year you receive it regardless of your method of accounting so expenses you paid by tenant so if your tenant pays any of your expenses those payments are rental income so note that you might be on people on a cash based system might think well look as long as i don't receive cash then i don't have to record it in income that's not the case for taxes. It's just going to cause you like a bookkeeping issue uh, to do that, right? Because usually most bookkeepers are recording income when the cash hits the checking account. So if you get paid in some way other than cash, so if the, if the tenant pays uh, any of your expenses, so you're like, don't give me the $1,000, but instead pay it to this third party, pay it to my ex-wife over there because... <laughs> because you're going to pay it to her directly and that way I didn't actually receive the cash and therefore I don't have to record it in income and she gets paid and I don't have to talk to her or anything. I don't have an ex-wife. I'm just kidding. I'm just like, but that would be, but that's not how it works because of course that would be the same situation as though they paid you directly and then you paid your ex-wife for whatever, right? So you can't just say, just pay it directly to the third party and then I didn't get the money so I don't have to record it in income. You have to record it in income. It's going to be a bookkeeping problem to, to do that because now you don't have the cash flow to, to record an income. So you might have to record, make sure to get it in the books somehow because you have to record it for taxes as income. Because you must include this amount in income, you can also deduct the expenses if they are deductible rental expenses. So in my example, you couldn't deduct the payment to the ex-wife uh, because it wouldn't be a rental expense. If, on the other hand, you said, don't pay me the $1,000, pay it directly to the contractor that worked on repairing something at the property. In that case, I, 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 again, you, so now you might be able, you might say, now I can include it in income. It would be as though you paid me the income, and then I took it and I paid the contractor. 
So therefore I should record it as income and then an expense. Now, so, so the only reason you would have them pay you or pay the contractor directly is if you have this idea in your mind that, well, I don't have to include it in income. You might say the net income is going to be the same either way, but you, but you want to, if you agreed on the rental to be so much money, you want to make sure that, that everything is consistent. You want to record the revenue and then the expense from a bookkeeping standpoint, it would probably still be easiest for the person not to pay the contractor, but to pay you the owner so that you can record it as income with your bookkeeping as the cash flows into your account as revenue. And then you pay the contractor so that from a bookkeeping standpoint, it's easy to see the outflow, which can then be recorded as an expense. So for more information, you can see rental expenses later. Example, so your tenant pays the water and sewage bill for your rental property and deducts the amount from the normal rent payment. So they owed you $1,000. They paid the rental and then they reduced the amount that they're going to pay you. The problem is that they've agreed to pay you the $1,000. So, so you, you need to be, so you would think according to the agreement that you should be receiving the thousand dollars, right? So, so under the terms of the lease, your tenant doesn't, doesn't have to pay these bills. So, so that's part, so it would be different if like they had to pay you a thousand dollars and then they were paying their own bills, not as part of your rental payment. These are things that the landlord was committed to pay according to the rental agreement. And then the tenant paid for those things and reduce the amount that they're going to pay to the landlord. Again, you might think that the bottom line is the same as though you paid it to the landlord and that the landlord paid those things, but it's the bookkeeping is going to be not, it's not going to look right because you agreed to have a thousand dollars. You should have the thousand dollars of income and then the expense related to it should be there rather than a net payment of something under a thousand dollars because the tenant paid off the expenses, right? So, uh, so include the utility bill paid by the tenant and any amount received as rent payment, uh, in your rental income, you can deduct the utility payment made by your tenant as a rental expense. So just logistically, then it would be a lot easier. You might, it would be a lot easier just to follow the cash flow, usually for most bookkeeping, meaning pay me the thousand dollars and then I'll pay the bill. So I see the cash flow going in recording as income. I see the cash flow going out, which I can easily record as an expense. If it's paid by the tenant, then you got to be a little bit, you have to account for it in the bookkeeping with something other than cash flow, right? Example two, while you are out of town, the furnace in your rental property stops working. Your tenant pays for the necessary repairs and deducts the repair pill from uh, the rent payment. So include the repair bill paid by the tenant and any amount received as rent payment in your rental income. You can deduct the repair payment made by your tenant as rental expense. So you might be in a situation where the, the tenant is like, hey, look, I, I have to do it this way because you're gone or something and they wanna get it fixed. So that's what they do. They say, I'm gonna get it fixed and then I'll pay you the, I'll pay you the, so I owed you a thousand dollars. Now I'm only going to pay you $800 because I paid for the fix myself because I needed to get it done. That means when you record the income from a bookkeeping standpoint, you're only going to have 800 from a cash flow that you're going to have to record as income. And then you're also going to have to possibly with journal entries record the 200 of income, increasing the income to equal the amount that they should have paid you and the other side, the, the credit would be income and the debit might be the expense, right? Or you might do it with, with, you know, invoices and bills or something like that. But you're going to have to, from the bookkeeping side of things, record, record not with the cash flow because the cash flow is going to be net. And you're going to have to say, increase the income with a credit of some kind, either with a form or a journal entry to get it up to a thousand and then record the expense, either with a debit journal entry or an expense form so that it, so that you can account for it. That's kind of just bookkeeping wise, how you might have to deal with that. Property or services. If you receive property or services as rent instead of money, include the fair market value of the property or services in your rental income. So this is another thing that might come to mind. You're saying, hey, look, if it's a cash based system and I don't get any cash, then I don't have to record income. So for example, if 
the the person the tenant happens to to make things like a painting or something and they pay you with a painting instead of a thousand dollars they give you a painting worth a thousand dollars or something like that then you still got paid the thousand dollars it just didn't get paid in the form of cash and therefore you would still have to record the revenue of a thousand dollars even though you didn't get cash for it which again would be more complex often from a journal entry standpoint because you didn't get the cash going into your bank account which is usually the triggering factor to record the income so it would probably be easier if they paid you the cash of a thousand dollars you took the cash recorded it as income and then paid them for the painting that they have which might be like a personal expense so in that case they pay you cash you take the cash you take a draw out of the business for personal and then you pay them right and they pay them for personal expense uh which wouldn't be be there again if they want to pay you for something other with something other than cash that's worth a thousand dollars and there's no and they don't have the money to pay you and they're going to pay you with some other thing then then again what you're going to have to do is possibly use some kind of journal entry or something like that because it's not going to hit your account with cash to record the revenue that you received uh in something other than cash right so if you got that painting, you might have a journal entry that basically is increasing the revenue. And then the other side is going to be like a draws because the painting is possibly personal, a personal thing uh, that was that was uh, received. <clears throat> so if the services are provided at, uh, at an agreed upon specified price, uh, that price is the fair market value unless there is evidence to the contrary. So if you receive property or services, so services could be they they do something, they mow, you know, they you know, they do landscaping for you or, or or you know, whatever, accounting doctor work or lawyer work or something. Example. So your tenant is a house painter. So he offers to paint your rental property instead of paying two months of rent. So in this case, they're not giving you something personal like a painting. They're gonna paint the property for two months of rent. You accept the offer. So include in your income the amount the tenant would have paid for two months rent. So you can deduct that same amount. So in this case, they paid us something for the property. So they're like, hey, look, I can't pay you right now for the two months, but look, I'll paint the house and that's worth two months rent. So if they paint the house, then you're still gonna have to record it as income because they're paying you at per an agreement with the painting of the house which again, you might need to do with a journal entry because you didn't get cash that actually went into your account, which is usually what triggers the transaction in a lot of bookkeeping systems to record it as income. And then if they're painting the house, that's gonna be a business expense. If it's a repair, then possibly you can, you can, expense, you, you can expense it and record the expense of the cost of paying the house. So rental income, if it was $2,000, and then expenses of $2,000 nets out to nothing, but the rental income should match that you've got paid in a similar way as the agreement. And then, and then they gave you something that was deductible uh, that you expensed for the same amount, the 2,000 of the painting of the house. If the house needed to be capitalized, then it's a different thing versus, but in any case, you can deduct the same amount as the expense for painting your property. Security deposit, all right. Don't include a security deposit in your income when you receive it if you plan to return it to your tenant at the end of the lease. So notice before we had the payment was for the last months of rent, which you're not going to give back to them versus a security deposit. Many places that I've looked at usually have the security deposit versus the last month rent. And in a security deposit situation, you wouldn't record it in income because in theory, it's not your money because you're going to have to give it back to them. The only way you would keep the security deposit is if they trashed the place or you have to spend the security deposit because you have to fix up the place after they leave. Now, we all know they're going to keep the security deposit, seems to me, most of the time, right? So, but the theory is that you're, you're going to give back the security deposit unless there's a problem with uh, the place, right? That's going to be the general uh, the general idea. And therefore, even though you've received money, uh, you, you, you're, you're in theory have to going to give it back to them. So you're going to record it. The cash goes up. And instead of recording rental income, you would put it to security deposit or unearned revenue or something like that, which would be a liability account. 
uh, on the balance sheet. But if you keep part or all of the secured deposit during any year because your tenant doesn't doesn't live up to the terms of the lease, include the amount uh, you keep your income in that year. So in other words, you collected a thousand dollar security deposit. It's in a liability for security deposit or unearned revenue, and then the tenant broke something or or messed something up, which means that you can dip into the security deposit recording it as revenue. So in that case, you're not going to give it back to them anymore because they broke the terms or something. And therefore, you're going to record it at revenue at that time, reducing the liability and recording the income. From a bookkeeping standpoint, you didn't get any more cash at that time. You already got the cash. So you're going to have to record that with possibly a journal entry or something like that uh, because you're basically doing kind of an accrual type thing in that case by tracking it on the balance sheet as a security deposit as a liability instead of recording it as revenue. So if an amount called a security deposit is to be used as a final payment of rent, it is advanced rent. So if the security deposit is really just payment for the advanced rent, then the IRS is going to say, well, you're going to, you're going to, you already got the money. You're going to get to keep the money. We want you to record it as income. Include it in your income when you receive it. Other sources of rental income. Lease with option to buy. So if the rental agreement gives your tenant the right to buy your rental property, the payment you receive under the agreement are generally rental income. If your tenant exercises the right to buy the property, the payments you receive for the period after the date of sale are considered part of the selling price. So that's kind of a somewhat of an unusual situation depending on the industry that you're in. Usually when you're renting the property, you're renting the property and they are not buying the property, but you could be in a situation where you have the rent to buy situation. And the question is, is this rental income or is it kind of like part of the purchase price? So part interest. So if you own a part interest in rental property, you must report your part of the rental income from the property. So now multiple people own the property that is being in, but the being rented. So clearly, you're going to have to deal with some kind of situation. Possibly you have a partnership situation, possibly needing to report a partnership return that records the rental income on that pro property, then flowing through to the individual par partners, possibly with a K-1 form. So, or if maybe there's a situation where you could split it out between the, the schedule ease of multiple people and so on. So rental of property also used as your income. So if you rent property that you also use as your home and you rent it less than 15 days during the tax year, you don't include the rent you receive in, in your income. So in other words, now you have your home, you're renting part of your home. That becomes a problem because now you have personal and business use of the same property, which is usually an issue on the expense side of things because you have to allocate then expenses between business and personal. But if you only rented it for 15 days, I believe the IRS is basically thinking that's a de minimis, a small amount, and therefore we're not going to deal with the whole rental thing if it's under that small amount of days. So if you go, so that, so, so that's the exception on the income side. But if you go over that amount of days, then you would, then we have this situation where you would think the rental income would be fairly straightforward because they paid you for the renting of the property, have to include that in income. And then the expense side of things becomes complex because you have this question of allocation as well as the depreciation situation becoming somewhat complex because the same property is your principal residence and has a depreciable component, which also makes it complex if you sell the property which was partially used for rental property because of the exclusion that is usually applied to your principal residence, not to rental property. So also expenses from this activity are not considered rental expenses. All right, so for more information, see used as a home, but rented less than 15 days under the reporting income. Now, why do they let you do that? Pro probably because you, they're thinking if you only got 15 days, you probably have expenses related to the rental property that exceed the income anyways, right? Uh, so so maybe they're not thinking you're, it's going to be worthwhile to record or something for that reason as well.